case you don't know Haiti, there it is on the map. It's a little smaller than Vancouver Island. And there are eight and a half million people that live, so it's a pretty crowded place. And there's another two million that live abroad who've been forced abroad by the conditions of poverty, as well as political repression that have uh, come and gone and been pretty constant in Haiti uh, for, for the modern history. And today, the country is once again under a foreign occupation. In uh, February of 2004, the elected government of Haiti was overthrown by uh, a combination of a, a rebellion of a small number of heavily armed right-wing forces that were operating out of sanctuaries in Dominican Republic. Uh, they were much more heavily armed than the very lightly armed Haitian National Police. One of the measures that the president of Haiti at the time had taken in 1995 was to abolish the Haitian army, which was a wonderful thing to do and was celebrated by the Haitian people. But there wasn't a large armed force in the country to deal with this kind of intervention. And so the combination of the right-wing rebellion and then an invasion uh, by thousands of soldiers from Canada, France, the United States, and Chile on February 29, 2004, overthrew not only the elected government but all of the, uh, the democratic institutions of the Haitian people. And today there's a, f a foreign occupation force of 7,100 soldiers, uh, 1,800 police. Uh, the majority, uh, the largest component of the military force is from Brazil and they have the, uh, they're assigned by the United States to lead the occupation force. Canada has 125 police who are engaged in training a Haitian National Police, which is a, a, um, a very um, a renowned uh, human rights violating uh, force. And this is a typical police patrol. This is in the north of the country in port au -Pay, but these the UN police vehicles are everywhere. They work uh, side by side with the Haitian National Police in, in patrolling the country. Um, the most notorious role that the UN forces have been playing is in suppressing um, uh, the efforts of people in the poorest parts of Port-au-Prince especially to, to try and organize against their, uh, their poverty, their worsening, worsening conditions. There have, uh, uh, following the 2004 uh, overthrow of the government, in the two years following that, there were a total of 8,000 violent deaths in Port-au-Prince alone. And that was a study that was commissioned by um, the University of Ann Arbor and published in the, uh, sorry, commissioned by the Lancet magazine. The, the people that did the study were from the University of Ann Arbor. That was published in September 2006 in the Lancet. Of those 8,000 violent deaths, 4,000 were attributed directly to the repression, repressive actions of the Haitian National Police and of the United Nations. So uh, I was hearing in the radio this morning that by comparison, the most notorious of the repressions that have taken place in Burma in recent history was in 1988 when the suppression of a popular revolt caused the deaths of 3,000 people. So that's to give you some perspective of what's taken place in Haiti, uh, uh, 8,000 in Port-au-Prince alone. Uh, this is a, a famous uh, expression of the independent struggle of uh, of Haiti in the foreground and in the background of the, is the presidential palace but this is a typical scene in front of the palace on a given day these are soldiers from Brazil who are there patrolling and their their numbers increased when we were there because there was a uh, political protest against the kidnapping of Levinsky Pierre Antoine and this is back in the north of the country in Cap Haitien this is um, the the UN contingent in Cap Haitien is composed of soldiers from Nepal and from Chile and just to remind you of location again, so that's the northern coast. That's Haiti's second largest city, Cap Haitien. It's about half a million people. And I show you this building, and actually there was one I forgot to show you earlier. If you look in the background here, you'll see a shell of a building. These were both government buildings in Cap Haitien that were burned to the ground uh, when the right-wing rebels took over uh, the city. So that's just to give you some idea of how violent was the, what I call a coup d'etat, in February of 2004 against the uh, Haitian government. Uh, the the right-wing forces were able to take control of the smaller cities like Cap Haitien. They were not able to, to take Port-au-Prince and for that was required the foreign invasion that I mentioned to you that took place. Canada had 500 soldiers that secured the main <coughs> national airport in Port-au-Prince at, at the time. But this was the kind of violence that was happening in the, um, in the cities as the um, the small but heavily armed uh, right-wing forces would, would come into town and basically disperse the small uh, Haitian National Police Force. I understand there were about 30 Haitian National Police uh, members who lost their lives uh, here in Cap Haitien during the coup. And I, I, I use the same name for the institution. The Haitian National Police became a very different institution after the coup of 2004. Basically everyone who was in the police before under the ARC government were fired and what was brought in to replace them were, uh, were former uh, 
uh, officials of the army and also of the, uh, the, the, uh, the right-wing death squads that had been operating in Haiti. This, this is the aftermath of Hurricane Jean and Gunaive in September 2004, and I place it in the same context as the coup because I think that uh, um, what, what took place here was a, a terrible humanitarian catastrophe. 2,500 people died in the city uh, during Hurricane Jean. Another thousand were never found. The city remained flooded like this for weeks. Uh, emergency medical aid uh, took, uh, took uh, several weeks to get in in any uh, substantive amount. Now, when a hurricane takes place, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a natural disaster, but it, it only becomes a social disaster when, when people in power uh, don't take the necessary measures to protect the population. So we all know what happened in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina. Well, this is a similar story. The, the, the coup of February 2004 had shattered, had not just removed a president from the country, it had shattered an entire uh, a democratic political order, but also the very social infrastructure of the country in towns like this, for example, that would have officials in charge who could communicate to the population, hey, a hurricane is coming, we better do something, we better get out of the way, we better get up to higher ground. That kind of civilian infrastructure didn't exist in Ghanaive at the time, and as a result, at least 3,500 people lost their lives. Uh, to give you a comparison, the recent Hurricane Felix in Nicaragua, uh, there were 100, uh, around 100 people that lost their lives, and that's an equally poor country, but the government in Nicaragua was able to take a lot of very decisive steps to prepare the region of the country that was hit by the hurricane. Now, the other shocking thing about Ganae, though, and this is again in the, uh, in the days and weeks, days after the weeks after the hurricane, but is the condition today. This is Ganaive. We drove through the city on our way to the north, and much of the damage and destruction of the hurricane, as well as of the coup, because there was similar damage to the city by the coup, but uh, most of what you're seeing here would have been caused by the hurricane. There's been no repair of the city. Um, the, the big crater in the middle of the street here was uh, what was the city. Some of the streets had to be broken up just to get uh, water drained out of the city. And so everywhere in the city is just rubble, sewage by the side of the road, as you see. And uh, really, it looks like a war zone. And this is three, three years now after the hurricane. So I, you know, I show you this and, and, in my opinion, describe this as something which is also a consequence of the coup of 2004. This is Port de Paix today. It's a city on the north coast. You saw it adjacent to uh, Cap Haïtien. Uh, like Cap Haïtien, it's a city which is bursting at the seams because the people living in the countryside who are poor uh, have nowhere to go but the city, but the city has nothing to offer them. Um, and so uh, it's very crowded. Um, there's no real services in the city. There's no, um, there's no uh, running water easily available. There's electricity is maybe a couple hours after dark. Uh, there's no jobs. Uh, there's no hospital in the city. It's a city of 200,000 people. Pretty tough conditions all around. It was pretty tough to, uh, to see this. And we met with the two deputy mayors. Uh, they gave us uh, an interview for an hour. And uh, what the deputy mayor on the right told us is that we, here in Port au Pay, we have, we, have, we have no civilian infrastructure. We get a small budget from the government, uh, basically $2,500 a year, I think, to provide services. He said that we're one hour of heavy rain away from a humanitarian catastrophe here in Port au Pay because the city is, we've got people everywhere, uh, squatting everywhere in the city, nowhere to house them, and we're very vulnerable to any uh, heavy rainfall that would happen. Um, there is no sewage disposal in, uh, in most of the cities, in all of the cities in Haiti, only in the well-to-do areas of, of, city, uh, of um, cities in, in Haiti are, is there sewage disposal. In a city like port au Pay, there's none at all, and this is how it takes place. People earn a couple of dollars a day to dig in the ditches and then someone else to truck it away in a wheelbarrow. The mayor said that one of their first um, acts in getting elected to office this March was to buy some wheelbarrows so this kind of work could proceed. So I guess we were seeing the city when it, there had been some cleaning up because the city has no, not a single wheeled vehicle for transporting people, garbage, sewage, as, uh, as is required. Even Port-au-Prince, uh, Port the capital city, has uh, great difficulty with garbage disposal, and this is a typical street scene in the city. Um, the garbage dump is the street corner until maybe uh, eventually the, uh, the city uh, has some money and resources to come along and clean it up. 